Welcome to the newest edition to the BTL family on a Friday morning. It is day five guide day. You know, I was sitting around last year and I've gotten the opportunity, especially over the past uh, year, to uh, to really chat and get to know some guys who have made their career uh, in the guide business. And most notably, I'd say I talked with uh, Rick Harris, who was in, in studio uh, to end last year, won a Toyota series. Uh, works for uh, Hill Country Hammers, went out and did his own thing down at Amistad for a long time. And that's kind of really where I got the idea. But I've kind of been friends with Rick from a guy who who wanted to get into fishing, who then threw Kirk Dove, kind of started guiding, then took the next step to go full-time guiding, and then took the next step to become part of Hill Country. And really, and I said, man, there's a, a lot of guys that I've gotten in the boat with uh, and that I've talked to and that have reached out through BTL that have really cool stories about guiding. Now, I think we can all agree the best guide stories, and we'll get into this in every episode that's going to drop uh, on Fridays at 8.30 a.m., is the nightmare guide stories, you know, with the client who comes out and, you know, has the jar of mayonnaise and does a spread or throws the rod and reel or demands to get taken back or something crazy. So we'll we'll always have the crazy guide stories. But you know, we talk about on BTL and have for the past this is the 20th season of BTL, kind of the stories behind the stories, get to know the person. And that's kind of the goal with day five. And then also, uh, having just got back from El Salto at Mexico, it was extremely helpful for me to have someone uh, who, who knew the guide, who knew the system to talk to the owner down there and then have the confidence. Cause let's face it in today's day and age, you're spending a lot of your hard earned money to go out with someone. And you kind of want to know what you're going to expect, what you can experience. Uh, and there's a lot of guides out there. So over this next year, day five guide day on Fridays with BTL is going to dive into the world of guiding. And we're going to go not exclusively bass. We're going to, to, to focus on bass fishing, obviously, but, uh, you know, we're going to do some Alaska stuff. Uh, we're going to do some Florida stuff, New York stuff that all sorts of different species. And we're going to kick it off today with captain Justin Jones, who is down in South Florida. Justin, thanks for being the inaugural guide on day five guide day with BTL. Thanks for having me on, man. Thanks for giving me the shot. I appreciate it. Yeah. Now, uh, I've known you kind of through social media over the past years. You follow the professional fishing game. You're in the industry. You know a lot of professional anglers, uh, but you also fish as a uh, co-angler last year on the Opens. You're actually fishing as a boater this year in the Opens on Okeechobee, which is where you guide and what we're going to get into. But we we shared a day on Watts Bar. It was Watts Bar, right? Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure I tried to erase that tournament from my memory. <laughs> Me too, but, man. Yeah. But I remember we had a really good day on the water and I knew, uh, I knew that you had done a little guiding and I wanted you to be the first on because you do some really cool, different stuff down in Florida, uh, where you guide just most notably to me are the exotics yeah. and that's gotta be I, I know like Monster Mike, doesn't he do some stuff like with the exotics on that? But like, dude, when I follow you on social media, I see the clown knife fish and the peacocks and all that. That's the stuff that gets my going. How do you get into that type of exotic guiding? So where I grew up in West Palm Beach, I live about 40 minutes from Okeechobee and 40 minutes from the coast. Uh, so up until about 10 years ago, you couldn't catch all of these species like you can today. Uh, before it used to get really cold down here or cold for Florida. Mm -hmm. And the cold is the only thing that will kill these exotics, especially the peacocks because they're from the Amazon. So anytime the water temps get below 60, they can, they can start to die off. And about 10 years ago, it started getting really warm and the peacocks started really taking over and they're just about everywhere. They're even in Okeechobee now. They aren't to where you can go and target them super easy, but they're there in the canals on the north end. Um, but yeah, so basically from West Palm all the way down to Miami, okay. uh, the state of Florida stocked peacocks because Florida has a crazy tank fish population. Everybody's, you know, got fish tanks down here. People release the Mayan cichlid and those are like bluegill on steroids. They got teeth. They're the Amazon version of a bluegill and that's the peacocks natural forage down there. So the state thought that if they stocked the peacocks, it would keep the Mayans in control. But really, it just all kind of 
went out of hand and now you catch mostly exotics in those areas where they are largemouth are still there but it's hard hard to catch bigger ones like anything over five pounds in those areas is pretty pretty impressive for a largemouth these days really so i'm gonna pull up a map of florida here so there's uh okeechobee yeah i'm on uh, the east side so basically from west palm right about so west palm lake worth delray beach area that's really where i guide for the exotics that's where you have snakehead clown knife and peacocks the clown knife haven't made it super far south down to where like uh monster mike's doing his stuff okay uh, so you're talking about this kind of neck of the woods right in here where i'm circling and a and... little more to the coast side yeah we're, okay. we're basically i'm you're on 95 like 95 goes along the lakes that i fish okay so i mean i've been to uh port st Lucie before i've been to fort yeah. pierce before vero yeah, beach jupiter yeah. That's where Tiger Woods lives, I think. I actually used to be sponsored by a skateboard company or a shop in Jupiter. Yeah, I spent a lot of time in Jupiter. So this is your neck of the woods where you... Yeah, this is where I lived. That That is basically where I grew up. Okay. Uh, so how well, did you get into the how did you get into the guiding game then? Talk about growing up. I know uh, I talked, I mentioned it to uh, Miles Berghoff on BTL uh, earlier this week. And he's like, oh yeah, like, I mean, his dad is like, is big time down there and has gotten into yeah. it. And I, I, I know Justin well, which I had no, no clue. You didn't mention that or anything when, when we were, when we were uh, practicing together, but just kind of talk a little bit about uh, your history with kind of this portion of Florida. Yeah. So my dad started guiding on Okeechobee out of Lakeport on the North end of Honey Pond area in the late eighties. And oh, wow. Yeah. He started tournament fishing. I was born in 90. So by the time I was born, my dad was pretty, seriously interested in like tournament fishing and just bass fishing in general he had been guiding for a few years and he bought a storm bass boat and started fishing tournaments and it was just that's all i've ever done i mean my earliest memories are him coming home from tournaments and me being out on the water with him uh i still remember my first top water fish all that stuff but um so fast forward i started fishing tournaments with him and when i was 10. um i cashed my first check when i was 11. I was like you. I did the casting kids thing. I got me a little medal. What? Yeah. Uh, 2001, the Bass Open that's super famous for Okeechobee being like at its lowest. It was at like nine foot. Greg McLean won it. I won the casting kids event there. Got to talk to Fish Fishburn, all that stuff. Went to the state championship. All that jazz. So you grew up in it. Yeah. Yeah. Did I was you know in, you always wanted to guide? Uh, I didn't know I wanted to guide, but I wanted to be a professional fisherman for sure. Uh, guiding. <sighs> Guiding is not easy to make a living. Like there's so many people doing it now that it, you really got to stick out or be good on social media, which I hate social media. <laughs> so I'm not very, you know, Instagram is about all, I, all that I do. Um, but yeah, I always knew that I want to be a professional fisherman. When, before all this high school and uh, college stuff, I was, they, the Bass Nation had to have a youth club for every federated club. Okay. So I was in the youth clubs until I aged out. I was the president of our Bass Rattlers Youth Club for a couple of years. And then I ended up aging out and you know started fishing big boy tournaments. How old are you now? Uh, 33. Okay. So when did you first start? Did you start on Okeechobee? Like, was that kind of your first guiding experience? Yeah, it's actually kind of crazy how I really got into it. So in 2013, somewhere around that time frame, one of the guides out here who's really well known, actually John Cruz, when he was a kid used to come and hire this guy with his dad and fish with him. He ended up having a heart attack on the water one day and his clients were, had never been on a boat, didn't know how to get back, none of that stuff. So they actually called the coast guard and got the coast guard involved. And the coast guard realized that all of the guides were guiding without a captain's license. Okeechobee is navigable waterway. So you have to have legally, you're supposed to have captain's license. So in 2014, there was like 30 of us out there that, they did this one time deal where a teacher came from the coast for sea school and did a nine day, 10 hours a day course. And like 30 of us got our guide license at the same time, our captain's license, the six pack. So I started pretty much at that time, 2014. Uh, and I, my only source of income since. Yeah. What does a captain's license mean? Like I see, uh, you see captain Justin Jones. Like what, what does that entail? You got to have one of these bad boys right here uh it's basically you get a merchant mariner credential uh the bare minimum that you are supposed to have is your uh, 100 ton six pack that's what most people have because to get your masters or get your tonnage back up you have to go down 
and tonnage and spend time on like a, all of this is for big vessel stuff. This is right. for all like all tanker stuff, like working th through the ports. Fishermen, bass fishermen will never use this unless maybe you're, you're on the Mississippi River and you're dealing with barge traffic. But um, yeah, that's that's really that's all it is. It's all paperwork to it's all controlled by the the, the Coast Guard. OK, but I know it's like not easy to get your captain's license. No, no, I know I, some buddies who have uh, attempted to numerous times and have not succeeded in their quest to become a captain. Yeah, you have to learn how to plot your courses, all that stuff. I mean, the rules of the road is the hardest part. That's where most people fail is all of the laws and rules that you have to know to pass your test. I mean, I almost failed. I, I missed the like by two or three points. And I got lucky the teacher because he knew our situation. He's like, bro, go back and look at one of your questions and might want to rethink that they give you one redo like on if you get a question wrong so does your dad kind of like take you under his wing and teach you like hey here's how you guide on on okeechobee here's the kind of stuff or did you kind of have to figure out your own way yeah, when it dad, came to that my dad never like i never he never taught, taught me how like this is how you do it out here i just fished with him and like watched and learned and listened to the guides all the guides down here work for or most of them i should say work for tackle stores. So, you, you know, you're just spending time in the tackle stores, looking at guys' rigs on the boat and stuff when I was younger. Um, yeah, I'm almost all self-taught. Me and my dad barely even talk about fishing anymore. We we're, we fish against each other now. So okay. <laughs> uh, the most we ask is like, hey, is the water clean over there? Or like whatever. We don't talk about anything really. So do you remember that first like cold call guide clients that you took out? I mean, you'd have had to have been in your young kind of my, mid 20s my first guy trip was the absolute nightmare guy trip <clears throat> the people really yeah the people didn't want to pay afterwards it was awful um <laughs> so i had bought a tr196 that had not been ran for like two years this guy had it and he wanted it it was supposed to be a project boat well i bought it from him because he said it you know he showed me a video of it running and stuff but in, i ended up having a lot of problems with it in my very first guy trip i i get them in the boat and all of a sudden i'm smelling gas and my motor won't stay running and my dad is putting in with me and he's like dude there's fish right here put it on the trolling motor go sit on this head and i did that and they caught a couple fish but the guy in the guy's head he didn't he didn't think that was well a good enough job he wanted to like run around the lake see the lake and all that stuff yeah and i went back and they told i was working for fast break bait and tackle at the time and they told my boss they didn't want to pay so it was a uh, it was in hindsight it was my fault for not being like hey blake my boat's not running I, I just listened to my dad that day and was like, you know, I'll just run with it, see what happens. Cause they caught fish and usually people are okay with that. But he just, the guy wanted to see sights and birds and run around the lake and stuff, which is totally understandable. So but, when I think Florida guiding, I think uh, the cork, the live shiner, the weed edge, and we've all seen it where you go out and you just smash big ones. Yeah. If you're looking to guide out there, like, do you do, artificial do you do the shiner thing like what's the difference between those two and if i'm going down to do a a fun guide trip like with my family or the boys or by myself like how do i de how do you determine like who is it artificial and whether you're doing the shiner thing for me it's almost like I, if i had my drillers i would do all artificial but we don't get that kind of clientele florida mm -hmm. Gets a lot of tourism. So most people either don't fish or fish very little. That's why you see so much of the shiner fishing. Um, now, shiner fishing is not a cure all. It is super hard to, to be good at it. Like you have to be pinpoint with your cast. You you got to know where the fish are and like why they're why or how they're going to eat those baits because you can rig them different ways. The shiners. Um, yeah, so we do, especially working for Rollins, we get a lot of like older clientele, people that are just trying to have a good time. We get a lot of kids. So we do a lot of shiner fishing for them. I almost always call my clients and say, hey, are you right hand retrieved, left hand? Can you use a bait caster or spinning rod, that kind of stuff? Like, do you want to do live bait more or artificial more? And, you know, you go, you, you get those kinds of clues to see what they're capable of to, you know, make the right decision to put them in a place to catch a big fish. So you work out of Roland Martin, the, the Roland Martin Marina out of, out of Clewiston. So that's yeah. kind of how people go through. I mean, yeah. you get a lot of, of people that book through Roland Martins and then they end up going out with you. 
Yeah. Yeah. It's either, it's either me getting clientele through word of mouth or, you know, Instagram and stuff like that. And I booked the trips with Rollins or Rollins has right now, there's like four of four or five of us that are here full time year round. And then mm -hmm. we have some seasonal guys that come down when our busy season's happening. Uh, but yeah, we're all in what's called called rotation or whatever. And they just give out trips as they come in. Okay. So I probably won't have a, a Florida guide on for the next couple months. So I want to dive into this Shiner thing because mm -hmm. I've heard guys who are like, eh, it's not that great. I've also heard guys who say, dude, Shiner fishing, like I went there expecting to not enjoy it. And it was one of the most fun trips I've ever had in my life. What do you expect for shy for shiner trips? Like, is it cool for tournament guys for hardcore bat? Like, I've never shiner fish, but it still kind of intrigues me. But then at the same time, I'm like, yeah, I don't want any part of that. Does that make sense? I'm the type of person I I used to feel a certain type of way until I started guiding, and I realized how hard it is to actually be good every single yeah. day with live bait because they're fish; they don't eat 24 seven. I'll, I'll be sitting there, and you know, guys around me will catch them all artificial because you're making them bite, but I say this, I want to catch everything that bites. I don't care how I got to catch it. You know, in tournament situations, obviously it's all artificial, but if you're just, you're, if you're just fishing, it's as a guide, it's my responsibility to know how and want to do all of it to catch the best fish possible. And live bait is, you know, it's not guaranteed, but it is almost, it's almost guaranteed that you're going to catch either a better quality fish or way more fish than you would ever do on artificial um yeah it's I, I don't care at all what people think about fishing live bait anymore because it is not easy and i know that you know? what's like an average like a solid average day of shiner fishing on okeechobee like what are we looking at numbers and size wise so on an average day a, a good a, a good average day is anywhere on live bait depending on if you're we do four six or eight hour trips so if you're we do a lot of four and six hour trips more uh -huh. Four to six hours, you're catching anywhere from 20 to 50 fish on a, on a decent good day. Oh, jeez. <laughs> yeah. So you're like hooked up. Yeah. I, yeah. I do everything I can. I hunt for them. Like I'm, I'm not just sitting there. If they aren't biting, there's somewhere else that they're biting. Mm -hmm. um, so 20 to 50 size wise. I mean, you're not 10 pounders aren't. No. Whatever. Right. I mean, that's. Okeechobee for whatever reason. I honestly believe that a lot of those really, really big fish are out in the open lake that they don't. They're, they're chasing gizzard chad because there's snook and tarpon out there too those they live their whole lives out there and those real true giants are out there in the middle of the lake and we hardly ever even see when they come in o okeechobee has an average of seven to nine pound fish like that's what th that's the average big ones you see especially this year on okeechobee i'm seeing a lot of seven to nine pound fish in the areas that are they're, they're spawning mm -hmm. um and that's usually that's usually the case there are some tens and there's a lot of like nine fourteens, nine fifteens. Um, yeah, it's those ten pounders are kind of rare on Okeechobee because of how things are set up right now. Is it a time of the year deal as far as groups of people? I remember having you know been down at Toho and been at, at uh well primarily uh Toho, but you see the guides and sometimes you know, you'll be fishing along and there'll be a guy that's set up shiner fishing and there's no one within 10 miles of them. Other times you go into an area and there's five guides and everyone's shiner fishing. I know if I'm booking a trip, sometimes I'm all about, I want to catch the fish. Sometimes I want to experience it, feel like I'm out in the swamp, see the alligators, feel like no one else is around. Is that kind of a give and take too, as far as how many other people are around or is Okeechobee a fairly crowded fishing lake when it comes to being in the spots where you got to catch them, you're going to be around other boats regardless of who you go out with. Yeah. From all of, all of my life, Okeechobee has been a place where people get crowded up, you know, back in the day when we had the hay fields, it was just like a parking lot out there, you know, it was bigger. So you could kind of stay mm -hmm. away, but still you would see 20, 30 boats for as far as you could see in every direction all day. You know, it's like, it's always been like that. There are very rare times that, you know, you get on a stretch where it's like two or three boats and that's the winning, winning place. Um, Okeechobee is so big that there are those spots out there, but to find them. And, you know, one thing that people do is they drive by and if you're there, they're like, huh, he's there. Might as well try and stop it and stop and try too. It, that happens every day, all day down here for sure. And then time of the year. Talk about the four different seasons. If you're going to to go down and go out on Okeechobee, specifically on a guide trip, 
you know, you got some people that go on vacation that can pick it, other people that are down for work. Like, what are the different things that that lake offers based on the seasons? So it's, it's, it's just like most places. The springtime is going to be the best because you're going to have Florida is unique. Our fish are already spawning. They started spawning late October, early November, and they will spawn all the way until June sometimes. Um, so you have a very vast time frame to get on the quote unquote spawn bite. But really what happens after February is the shad start spawning. So you have the gizzard shad and the thread fin out on the outside edges. So all of your fish that have already spawned, they start moving out into the outside reeds and Kissimmee grass. So you can, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff from March to June. Um, literally any type of fishing that you want to do and it catch lots of them because you have that shad spawn happening in, in the morning and then around april yeah around march april may the bluegill start spawning and you'll that's when that that's when you see those really big frog bags like you know 36 37 38 pound bags on the frogs when those bluegills start to move in so you know it's it's like most places the spring is the best um mm -hmm. summertime can be really good but you got to be able to handle the heat you know we're still catching even in july and june you know, late summer, we're catching 30 plus pound bags, flipping jigs, throwing a frog, you know, swim jig, stuff like that. So if I, uh, so if I wanted to like book with you in March or April, can I do like a frog trip? Like, are you oh, up to be like, Hey, yeah. like, listen, I don't care numbers wise. Let's just throw a frog and hope we hit it. Right. Like, are those oh, the type of trips that you really like the best? Yeah. Without a doubt. Fishing a frog. I mean, top water is my thing. I would say it's my strong, really? any type of, any type of top water. Um, if you look at the, the frog has been the most dominant bait for Okeechobee for the last decade. There's two kids down here that are, you know, there's more than two, but the two kids that I know the best are, uh, Kale and Brad, they've absolutely destroyed almost everyone down here. Him, uh, them, Chris Sherlin, all those guys, the frog has been the absolute deal down here. They've won the, that, that Bass Pro Shops mm -hmm. tournament down here on it. You know, it's easily the most dominant technique down here. Frog fishing here is phenomenal. So you could do like just a three day top water trip. Yeah, all day, all day long. Uh, between a frog and a spook, no question. Really? Uh, is the devil's horse still a big thing down there? Yeah, uh, it is. I. It's funny. My tournament, my tournament partner and me, we actually have caught in a lot of fish on the Bangalore. That one's, you know, they're hard to find now. The good one. Prop bait. Yeah, dude. Those those build Bangalores with the prop bait on the back is the deal. Um, I still throw a devil's horse, but it's kind of hard to, they're not the same anymore. You know, they don't, they don't float the same. You got to do things to them to get them to sound and work. You got Terry Scroggins them up. Yeah, you really do. Yeah. <laughs> especially them. My favorite one out of the pack, to be honest, would be the boy howdy, the cotton cordial, cotton cordial boy howdy. You put some hooks on that thing and just go to town. All right. Uh, anything else on Okeechobee that I'm missing or, or as far as largemouth bass, is that, are you an Okeechobee exclusive guy? No, I, I'll go to Headwater. Oh, really? Yeah, I'll, I'll I'll go anywhere, but that's just where Rollins really wants us to yep. do all the trips out of there as much as we can. Okay. So how do you determine – this is the other thing that's always got me on Florida. How do you determine where you want to go on a guide trip? Like let's say I've got two days. Like how do I know? Do I want to go out on Okeechobee? Do I want to do a Headwaters? There's a number of different fisheries in that area. Yeah, it's kind of what you want to experience. Like, there is nowhere else like Okeechobee as far as its vastness and like how just how big it is, how much is out there. Um, most of the other lakes are pretty small and they all look fairly similar, you know, uh, it's grass, pads, reeds. Um, now, as far as fishing, like if you want to do a certain technique, like say, hey, I want to go throw big baits. Mm -hmm. Headwaters is, is really good right now. It's got a lot of hydrilla. The water's clean so those fish can really see that bait. That's a big problem with a lot of Florida lakes. The water is dark. So, you know, you can catch them on certain techniques in that dark water that, you know, you can't catch them on, you know, other places like the Hydrilla Lakes, Kissimmee, uh, Headwaters, you know, Toho, all those places. You can do a lot of offshore grass fishing where Okeechobee just doesn't have that. So it's kind of, you know, what you want to experience as far as okay. like technique wise if you are into artificial fishing they do do set up differently for different techniques yeah. and then in your opinion if you're going to do a, a, a freshwater bass guy what is the 
perfect length? Like, let's say you could do one, two, three, four days. I mean, is it, would you say a two day trip is gets you to be kind of give you a chance at a big one and experience what you want to experience and you can kind of mix it up? Yeah. It depends on how hardcore you are. Um, I'm definitely going to say if you're just out here to just experience it, no more than two days. Like you, you, unless, unless you are here to learn this, it's hard to fish here. Like this, it's work. <laughs> like yeah. you're, you're casting and working a bait and staying hung up almost all day. Like it is work. You're not there. It's not like you can go throw a drop shot and, you know, catch easy. Work. easy. Like it's straight up. Work. <laughs> no, I'm saying easy. Don't be, don't be bad mouth of that drop shot. No, Justin. No, no, I know I, you, you do damage with it for sure. <laughs> I actually, I've caught clowns on the drop shot. I figured out a way to do that for the clowns, but, um, really? yeah, but, but two days. And then if you're in for work or business, is it, is a four hour trip worth it? I've always wanted to know that too. I've always seen yeah. like a four hour trip, but I'm sitting there going, what can you really accomplish in four hours? But you, you seem catch, to think you can catch a bunch of fish in four you hours. Catch a bunch in four hours. Yeah. I, I, that is honestly what we do the most of is four hour trips. Uh, definitely a, the, the majority of our trips are four hour trips, except for the hardcore, uh, you know, artificial guys, mm -hmm. they want to stay all day, but in four hours, I've had, you know, hundred plus fish, four hour days, you know, I mean, that's on a good day, but it's mm -hmm. nothing to catch 20 fish, 30 fish, 40 fish in four hours. It, it definitely sounds like if you have inexperienced anglers, young anglers, kids, you just want to put fish in the boat, like yeah. a four or six four hour trip. shiner trip is yeah, the deal. Yeah. And even with artificial, you're not going to catch as many, obviously, mm -hmm. usually, but you can still catch 15, 20 fish on artificial in four hours on a good morning, you know? All right. Uh, am I missing anything else on the bass before we transition to, I mean, I don't want to say bass isn't cool, but before we transition <laughs> to the cool stuff. Yeah. I mean, it's all pretty simple, pretty straightforward. I mean, I'm not, other than hard work, I'm not doing anything, you know, crazy outside of the box. I mean, I throw yeah. big baits a lot, you know. I got into the big bait thing, which most people are now, you know, there's a lot of guys doing it, but, uh, Okeechobee is an incredible place. You know, if you want to catch big, large mouth, they're there, you know. All right, let's go outside the box. So this is a clown knife fish. Yep. Uh, I've seen these for several years and this is kind of how I know you. Yeah. Like you're the guy who catches clown knives and peacocks to some extent, but this thing right here is on my bucket list and you've taken out a number of other professional anglers, not, not, or a number of professional anglers, uh, to catch these things. Talk about what the heck this is, where it is and how you got into guiding for these things. So these fish are from Southeast Asia. Uh, they are really unique. Like you can see their body. They have one little dorsal fin. And even when you catch them, they're usually not that big. They're usually pretty tiny. Uh, so they're very eel like they actually swim backwards. Their whole body is just a fin, like a blade. So they're very eel like, um, they breathe air. So you can visually see them. They'll come up and show themselves. Um, they can live in almost any condition. So that's why they are so popular or they're not popular as far as like people really wanting to like catch them. People are, they're exotic and invasive. So there are some people that like them. Some people that don't, I don't care. I just want to catch whatever bites. Um, they are easily one of my favorites to target because almost every single person down here only live baits for them because they are not easy to catch on artificial, or at least a lot of people haven't devoted their time to learning how to do it. I set out about five or six years ago when I first started catching them real thick, like they weren't around forever. They were, you'd catch one every now and then, but like I said, the last 10 years, we've had a lot of warm weather, so they've been able to grow. And about five, six years ago, I was like, I have to learn how to catch these on artificial because I don't want to be like all these other guys where you go catch live shad and that's what you do. Because every now and then you'd catch one on a lure and then people just think that it's kind of happenstance, but there's a reason for every everything or a reason why, or if one bites it, then that means another one will bite it. So I spent way more time on that body of water than I did Okeechobee for a long time, just trying to figure out how to catch these exotics on different types of artificial lures that other people weren't throwing for them. Size wise, uh, it's kind of hard to show the comparison, but what are we talking about size wise is there's a, there's a cloud knife fish. Yeah, that's swimming. So they are like, you can kind of tell they're pretty thin. Like they don't get very wide. Like a wide one is like, you mm -hmm. know, like that big. 
um, but they're extremely long. They get well over 30 inches. You know, I've seen them like 38 inches. Um, they're huge, huge lengths, but they only weigh like a big one is 10. I think the state record is 13 pounds. There's bigger ones out there, obviously. Just I've seen them. Um, but they are like a good one, six to 10 pounds. And what are we talking numbers wise? Like, are we going through, uh, is this a musky type trip where you're like, uh, my God, we saw a clown knife. Yeah, or is see, this, <laughs> Yeah, no, this is, this is the thing is that for a long time, they're pretty rare unless you're using live baits. So they're not, okay. they're, they're primarily a nighttime feeder. Like if you, there's some guys that are bow fishing for them at night, bow hunting them. And they get on the bank at night and they'll feed at night. So most of the time that you're catching them during the day, they're out suspended. That's what I figured out about them is they're a suspended <laughs> fish. They breathe air. So they'll come up and show themselves and then suspend right where they just came up from. They don't go over here. They don't go over there. Like they literally come up, get air, go back down and suspend in the water column almost all the time. So I, and this is something about Florida fishermen. Almost all of us don't know how to fish suspended fish. There aren't very many lakes that people even have considered fishing for suspended fish until the last few years with forward facing sonar and all that jazz. So I did this. I don't even have electronics really, except for on the front of my boat. I've got, you know, I had one graph that showed me the depth and stuff. Mm -hmm. And I, but um, yeah, so I just really spent a lot, a lot of time uh, learning suspended fish techniques. You know, don't want to give away too much, but right. the number one that a lot of people, I've seen other people catch them on it, but I figured out a real like dialed in way is the finesse swim bait. That, oh, show and tell. That shockwave right there, if there's any bait that missile baits is not being talked about enough, it's the shockwave. That bait right there, I've caught so many fish on. Peacocks, largemouth, clowns, all of it. So that's that's one of the main techniques that I do. And you don't catch you don't catch a hundred in a day, but I've caught 10 in a day. Um if you're if you can make a cast and you can work a bait, I can put you on a few in a day in my mind pretty easily. I mean, that's a bucket list fish, like kind of one of those, like in my opinion, it's a one good fish makes the day. Yeah. And what's for, so for someone like me who's never even been on a body of water that has them? Yeah. They they are Florida is the only place that has these things other than, you know, the other places in the world where they're from. Uh Florida is unique in that fact. We have all kinds of species that are only here. How many guys are guided for these things artificial? Are you kind of one of the only guys that's really going at this hardcore with a bass background? Yeah, like I was saying, most of the other guys, like if you go over there, they've all got, you know, like open bay boats or flats boats or whatever, and they're all live bait shad fishermen. They all cast net. Every morning they go out, cast net the shad, meet their clients, mm -hmm. go do that. Um there are some guys that are fishing off the bank, but there aren't very many guides that are like really hardcore artificial trying to catch these guys. In my opinion, I'm out there a lot and I, I see what they're doing and I'm one of the only ones that I know of. So is this a like a clown knife fish only trip or do you mix in other can, cichlids and species at the same yeah. time? So like what's a, a typical day include then? Because I would obviously... I'm, I'm in, like, I've talked to you about this. Like we've talked about, like, try to figure out the schedule because I'm like, dude, I, I want this, this, this suckers on my bucket list. I, like I said, I saw a great buck holding one up. I've seen your videos. You talk about how you catch them on the artificials, but what's a, what's a full day out for the exotics include. So in one day we've caught up to 12 different species on artificial out there. Uh, there's a bunch of different types of cichlids. Like most of these are tank fish that people have released. They just didn't want them as pets anymore and they let them go. And then they just go crazy. So your average day, especially fishing like this, you know, you're going to catch largemouth peacock, They're, your clowns. There's a bunch of different, those different types of cichlids. One what, of my what's a cichlid? Talk about the different, what those are. So there's Vija. The main ones are Vija, Midas, Mayans. They're basically tank fish. They're from the Amazon that people have, you know, they wanted as pets and then they released. They are a bunch of different colors. They're like I said, the Mayans are the peacocks natural forage in the Amazon. So they're like bluegill versions. Just really pretty. They're just Amazonian bluegills. <laughs> so like that. Yeah, that's a Mayan. That's the peacocks natural forage. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I feel like I caught some of those down in Mexico. 
Yeah, they're they're all in South America, Central America, Mexico. Yeah, all of that. That's 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 why peacocks are here is because the state wanted to control those. Okay, so what was another one? Uh, Avija, V E I J A. Let's see if I can pull up one of those. Are they? What do those things look like? They, they oh, people confuse them for a flower horn, but they're not a flower horn because they have a big bulb on their head. People think they're flower horns, and they're like a bunch of different colors. But they're called a bija cichlid. They're a diff, different breed. Like that? No, that's not it actually. Yeah. The, okay. So just, but all sorts of stuff that. So if you have a list of things that you want to knock out, like if you're a new species guy or have an experience of every time you hook something, it's a good chance you've never caught it before. This is the freaking trip. Yeah. This is the place to be. Cause I could, you could take a Ned rig dude. I could put a Ned rig on for you and you could catch cichlids and peacocks and largemouth all day long. It's just so much fun. And you have no idea when it, you don't know you when it like a normal Ned. Yeah. Yeah. And you don't know what's going to bite. It's just, there's so much different stuff down there. You How catch- big? Like what size are we talking? Oh, they the cichlids, the, especially the Vija cichlids. You know, they get over twelve inches, and they they're pure power. So they're they're dogging you, like they're drag, they're just pulling it. <laughs> They'll straight down, dog you. Is this it? Is it like rainbowy? Yes, that's them. That's the Vija cichlid. Yeah, dude, those are freaking cool looking. Yeah, so this is this is one they kind of oh, they kind of have a bump yep. on the head. Yeah, and they yeah. eat a Ned rig. They'll eat, they destroy a Ned rig, dude. They it, they are so much fun. You can catch those things all day long in the summertime, and it's a blast. People so don't what, like you, it, you start out top water swim bait, and you get your cloud knife, and then you just go knock out however many you can the rest of the day. Or if you get addicted to the cloud knife, you stay and follow that all day, or you can target yeah. the peacocks. Yep. yep. How many days a year would you say you do the exotic trips? Uh, it's less now because I'm working for Rollins. So two years ago is when I went full times for Rollins. Mm-hmm. So I'm on Okeechobee a lot, but if somebody requests to do the exotic trip, I do it. Yeah, uh, it's actually my favorite place to fish. Honestly, Okeechobee's work. This place is just a blast. It's just fun to fish. How many are we talking about? Like each day, then total fish. Like if you're going on this average day, how many times are you getting a bite from oh. something? So the one thing is they don't like the cold. So I would say in the winter time you're going to catch way less exotics, but you're going to catch them. You're, you still catch peacocks and clowns and stuff like that, but you're not going to catch the numbers. You want you want to be there. And so the peas start spawning after the largemouth. So about April through June is when the peacocks spawn and they're up on the bank and you can you can sight fish them. You can do all kinds of stuff. I've catch them on big swim baits uh, like glide baits and stuff. Uh, I would say average in the summertime uh, you're catching. It's similar to Okeechobee. You're catching 30 to 100 fish, depending on how long you stay out there. And that's a full day, or you do four, six, and eight hours, too? Yeah, four, six, and eight hours. That's that's what is pretty much standard down here. If you want to go longer, we do longer, but it costs a little extra. I'm all in on that. That sounds fun. I didn't realize that there were like a dozen other types yeah, of Yeah, I've caught, I've caught 12, different, 12 different species in one day down there. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, is this something that you would recommend? Can you get a really good experience in this in one full day? Oh yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a one day, one day deal. Like you don't want to spend, you don't want to book five days in a row of this probably. Pro- you can, you're yeah, cool. you would love it, but I mean, I love it. it's good money. But- I mean, in, in all reality, like you can, this is a bucket list trip that you're yeah. going to go spend some coin on and catch some really cool stuff that you're going to be able to take badass pictures of and have it in your back pocket the rest of your life. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. It, to get in contact with you to do this, um, I, I hesitate to ask prices because I don't know when people are watching this and I know that changes. Uh, just th- if you're cool, throw out some ballpark figures. Well, uh, I, I can give you Rollins. Is, I work for Rollins, so their prices are pretty standard. I mean, there are some guys doing a little cheaper and there are guys, some yeah. guys doing a little more expensive, but we're pretty average. We, we try not to undercut or be too crazy expensive. So four, six or eight hours is for two people. We supply everything except for live bait. It's 350, 450 or 550. A third person's an additional hundred dollars. Okay. And then, you know, I try not to do more than three people plus me because I really want to try and take care yeah, of it. That sounds like a disaster. I wouldn't yeah. want to go on a guide trip with more than three people. That just doesn't yeah. sound fun to me. 
Yeah, I mean, I get it. Sometimes you're on a business trip. You got four guys. You want to pack them in. But. Yeah, and there are guides that if you want to do like three, or like four or five people, we got some bay boats for you. But if you want a good experience, I really suggest two to three people max. Okay, and then the uh, the exotic stuff. It's the same. Yeah, it's the same prices. Dude, you should be booked like 90 billion days out on that because it looks freaking fantastic. The, pro the problem is, man, there's a lot of people down here doing it. And then, like I said, I'm unique in the fact that I come from a tournament fishing background. Almost everybody yep. else that's doing it is just, just doing it for a paycheck. Um, this is I'm obsessed. This is my life. And I want, I want people to be able to catch them as good as I catch them. So I do everything I can to get you on them. Yeah, so it's almost like a bass fishing experience. Like, I mean, if you oh, if, yeah. if you went down there, like you're gonna be up there teaching, learning, fishing as well. Like, do you fish too for those things, stand up front, and it or depends. does it just kind of depend? It depends. So if I, I I do try to fish a little bit just to figure out what they might want because every day is different. There is I, that is something I've learned from guiding is there is you fish seven days, not one single day you're gonna be doing the same exact thing. Yeah. You know? So I do fish a little bit. Some guys don't mind me fishing. Some guys do. Like, you just have to tell me or I'll ask, like, hey, do you mind me fishing? If you do, then I'll just, you know, try and tell you what to do. But a lot of times I fish just to, like, help show where to cast, how to cast, you know, how to work the lure, all that jazz. All right. Uh, give your socials out where people can get in contact with you if they want to uh, jump in the boat and either chase some artificial, uh, artificial cichlids and cloud knife fish or – get on uh okeechobee what is it the fifth largest man-made lake or something or it's the fifth largest natural lake that's yeah, natural yeah a lot of people get completely encompassed in the united states yeah yeah that's the one thing is like if you look at the great lakes that some of them go into canada i think it's yep. definitely in the top three or four of the ones that are only in the u.s it's 700 square miles of water seven hundred ten thousand acres all right if people want to get out on that acreage where can they find you so I am pretty bad at social media. I'm <laughs> going to get better at it. I'm going to start a TikTok and YouTube and all that jazz. But right now I'm on Instagram. Uh, it's Captain or C A P T period Justin Jones. Uh, you can't really miss me on that. Uh, give me a follow there. I'd really appreciate it. Like and share that stuff. Uh, I need a, as much help as I can growing that thing. But um, and then you can go to Ro Roland's uh, their website. You can go there or call them and you can request me through them. Okay. Uh, are you excited? So you are, is this your first open as a boater? Yeah. Coming up here on uh, Okeechobee. Are you looking forward to that? I'm scared, man. I don't want to get my teeth kicked in. You know, Okeechobee is so hard, even though I've lived here all my life. I don't, there isn't a whole lot of um, home field advantage because these areas get so pressured. You know, you could be 50 yards and that dude catches a, an eight pounder. And he's 50 yards away from you and you catch 12 pounds. You know, it's just one of those deals. So I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really thankful that my first one as a boater is going to be on my home lake. I just hope I don't suck too bad. <laughs> that's, a, that's a vote of confidence right there. <laughs> that's got to be tough, though. Like, how often are you are you in a tournament out there and you're in an area where you know that you could just be axe murdering them with live bait? And and does that happen a lot? Yeah, so that is one thing about the shiner fishermen on Okeechobee. Don't really pay attention to too much of that. Like, just know that there's fish in the area because those fish – that are eating that those shiners hardly ever eat those live bait or the, the artificial. artificial they're almost always they're almost always live bait fish you know uh, a lot of times when we sit in those areas those those fish kind of get baited up and they'll stay in an area and they'll stay on like that wall and they'll only eat live bait or whatever but just if remember the fact that there's shiner boats around that there's usually fish in that general area yeah. but they they are fishing for fish that you are not fishing for. Do those shiner fish like know what's up? Like, do they know they're going to get caught, take a picture of, and release? But it's worth it for the shiner. <laughs> you can you can definitely tell. Like once you start like on a good morning when they're biting, 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 and you catch like 10, 15, 20 in a row, you definitely see them get a little weary. They'll start blowing them up and not eating them or pulling them down and not getting mm -hmm. it. You know, you they definitely ain't, they ain't stupid. They, they know that their brothers are getting hooked and they don't want to get hooked. All right, anything else you want to get in here before I let you go, Justin? No, nah, dude, I just am super thankful for the opportunity. Thanks for letting me be the first one to do this. And I had a good time fishing with you and hope I can get a, get you on a clown soon, man. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, check the description uh, in the uh, YouTube video here uh, for links on how you can get a hold of uh, Justin and then also on uh, iTunes in the description. And I'm going to let you go. I greatly appreciate you being a part of the first Guy Day Day 5. 
Peace out. Thanks. All right. Uh, that was Captain Justin Jones. Like I said, I'm trying to get a feel for the entire country and all the different guiding that goes on across it. Uh, really unique experience with the clown knife fish, uh, especially with what he's doing artificial wise. I've spent time in the boat, Justin, super chill guy, super easy, knows his stuff, very good bass fisherman. So I know we have a lot of hardcore bass anglers that listen to BTL. So if you're in that area, if you want a unique experience, I mean, I've, I was shocked at how low that actually was. It is a, uh, it is definitely on my bucket list. And uh, I think that's all we got for the first day five show. Listen, I am open. If you've got a guide experience, a guide, a trip, something that you have that you have been on, uh, you are a guide. Now, there's obviously limited number of these, so I can't get everybody in, but I'm going to try. And then also, I want guys that, you know, verified that either I've been out with or know or have firsthand definitely looking forward to hearing from a bunch of different uh unique guiding guides with guiding experiences across the country so that's it there's the logo day five guide day we'll see everybody on monday for regularly scheduled btl